Has anybody ever told you that you look like your mom or you look like your dad? I grew up hearing that all the time. People would say, Jordan, you look exactly like your dad. You've got the same curly hair. You've got the same smile. You've you got a dimple in your face. You walk like him. Your mannerisms are similar. I grew up hearing that, and I didn't believe it as a kid. But now people are saying the same thing about my kids. Any of you have kids that look like you? Have you apologized? <laughs> I have. I'm like, hey, I'm sorry, man. You, people always say, you look just like me. I'm sorry that that's the truth. But that's just the way that it works, isn't it? We as children, we naturally inherit certain characteristics from our biological parents. That's the way that it works. It's human biology. It's all about DNA. But you know, when it comes to spiritual biology, things work a little bit differently. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, that, that all of us were created in the image of God, the imago dei. It says that every single person that's ever been created, that's ever been born on planet earth, was born and created in the image of God. And that means that we all have some resemblance to God in some way. But the truth is, and you know this, you can resemble someone all day long and be nothing like that person. I had the privilege of playing golf a couple months ago at, at a prestigious golf course in North Carolina. It's one of those golf courses that's way too nice for my game. I'm a mediocre golfer at best, but here I find myself at one of golf's greatest courses and I'm trying my best to at least look like I know what I'm doing. I mean, it was one of those moments where I'm like, okay, I've got I've to show up strong. In fact, I bought a brand new golf bag, one of the big leather professional looking golf bags. And I showed up about two hours before my tee time and I was going out to the driving range and man, I was, I was decked out, all right? I had the, the new golf cleats, the, the, the spikes on, I had golf slacks and a matching shirt. I had a, a white golf belt that matched my new white glove and my new white hat. I mean, I was dressed up for this moment because I was like, I don't know if I'll ever play a nice course again in my life. So I make my way out to the, 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 uh, the driving range. I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm getting loosened up. I'm about to take a couple of swings. And as I was preparing to take that first practice swing, something distracted me. I, I could hear some people behind me. So I kind of leaned into the conversation. And finally, I could hear what they were saying. There was one person standing about 10 to 12 feet behind me. And this is what they said. They said, hey, is that Ricky Fowler? <laughs> And then I could hear the other person. They're like, I think that's him. I think that's Ricky Fowler. And if you don't know, Ricky Fowler is a professional golfer. And he's one of the best in the game. And now I've got people behind me <laughs> believing that I am Ricky Fowler. I'm at this really nice golf course. I'm dressed apparently like he dresses. And now they're preparing to watch me swing my club. <laughs> And so in that moment, I don't even look back to acknowledge that they're there. I don't even think about it. I'm, in my mind, this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, I'm about to blow their minds. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm over the ball and I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to swing as hard as I can. I'm going to smoke this ball and I'm going to jack with their brains, right? They're going to think, that's really him. And then I did it, man. I swung that club as hard as I could swing a club fully anticipating that ball to fly far. I chili dipped that ball like you've never seen anybody chili dip a ball. I'm talking about it rolled. It didn't fly, it rolled. And then I had to stand there embarrassingly watching that ball roll about 40 or 50 yards until it came to a screeching halt. Well, let's just fast forward to what happened next. In that moment, I'm thinking, this is the moment I'm going to face my new fans. And so I turn around, and you want to guess what? They gone. Man, there's nobody. No one standing behind. Listen, when they saw me swing that club, they realized real quickly that I was not who I appeared to be. Listen, you can resemble somebody all day long, and you can be absolutely nothing like that person. Today, there are a lot of people walking planet Earth, populating planet Earth, people that were made in the image of God, just like you and I are made in the image of God, people that have a, a spirit and a soul and a mind, and yet they look nothing like the God who created them. And you have to ask why, right? 
You have to wonder why. If all of mankind was created in God's image, then why doesn't all of mankind resemble God? And I think the answer to that question is pretty simple. The reason so many people look nothing like God is because so many people don't really know God. So many people don't follow God. So many people haven't had a life-changing experience from the God who created them. When Paul wrote to the believers in Ephesus, he was writing to a very specific group of people. We know that because of what it says in chapter one, verse one. He says, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus. So he's writing to people who knew God, people who were faithful in following God, which lets us know that these are people that have been changed by God through the person of Jesus Christ. Verse four says, for he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. So don't miss this today. If you have been saved and forgiven, if you have been redeemed and made new, that's because Jesus came to you. It's because he chose you and offered his salvation to you when you were unworthy and when you were un unable to save yourself. Before you were ever born, the Bible says that God knew that he was going to send his son to save your soul. Verse five says he predestined us to be, look at this word, adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself. By the way, that's where life change happens. Life change happens when we are adopted into God's family. Let me tell you why. When we're adopted as sons and daughters through Jesus, the scripture says we become spiritually joined to God. I want you to think about that. We become joined to God. And when that happens, the Bible indicates that being joined to God sets off a reaction that's gonna lead to some natural changes in your life. Because now we're not just people that were made in the image of God like everybody else was made in the image of God. No, now we have the nature of God. We have the spirit of God. We have the presence of God. We have the power of God. We're no longer talking about human biology or human DNA. We're talking about spiritual biology. And because of Jesus, we inherit a new spiritual DNA. Get this today. When God adopts you, he changes you. If you are adopted, you cannot remain the same. Why? Because he changes your spiritual DNA. He enables you to live a new kind of life, a life that has the spirit of a living God living through your veins. You think differently, you live differently, your life begins to look differently. And the people around you should be able to see the difference that Jesus makes. I remember when I was a teenager, my parents brought all of our family to my dad's high school reunion. And let me tell you something, it was weird. It's weird to be a teenager in that setting. A bunch of old people walking around, carrying drinks, trying to figure out who's who. And now I find myself as a teenager walking through this gymnasium filled with strange adults that I've never seen before. And the weird thing is, time after time, they would point their finger in my face and say, you have got to be Ernest Easley's boy. You've got to be. And as a teenager, I'm thinking, well, man, I'm not even wearing a name tag. I'm not standing next to my dad. Nobody introduced me. No one knows my last name, but it seems like everybody knows who I am. And then I figured it out. They know who I am for one simple reason. It's because I look like my dad. Let me ask you a question. When strangers see you, do they see the resemblance to your father? Do people you encounter, the people you live with, the friends in your inner circle, the people you go to school with, do they look at your life today and say, wow, their life looks more like their dad every single day? Because scripture says when God adopts us, he changes us. When he adopts us, he essentially chose to demonstrate who he is to this world. And he chose us to demonstrate the DNA of heaven. He included us in his family so that we would tell the world about our dad and, and show the world the difference that he has made in our lives. See, the Bible says when we're saved, we become a part of the family of God. And I love the fact that when we become a part of the family of God, the Bible says it happens immediately. You need to hear this today. You don't have to earn your way into the family of God. 
Jesus paid everything that needed to be paid in order for you to become a child of the king. And when he saves you, that's exactly what happens. You are adopted as a child of the king. You know, I love this picture of adoption in the Bible. Because when you look at it, you have to think about the day that it was written. See, according to the Roman legal system in the first century, those who were adopted received the same legal rights as a normal son or daughter. You think about that. A natural child received the same rights, had the same privileges as the adopted child in the family. There was no difference at all. By becoming a member of the family, an adopted child gained all the rights to the father's estate, was seen as an equal heir to the other sons and daughters in the family. They were considered to be co-heirs according to the law. Something else that's very interesting about the Roman law of that day was that when you were adopted, in that moment that you became a child, everything in your past, your entire slate was wiped completely clean. You had a fresh start. You had a new beginning. All previous debts were erased. You were now in a new relationship with a new family. Your past would no longer be counted against your future. And man, every time I think about adoption, I think about my own life. I think about the gospel and how it changed me. Listen, aren't you grateful that God, through Jesus, wiped your slate clean? Adoption is a perfect picture of the gospel. And if you've been saved, you get that. If you've been saved, you've been adopted. And and you haven't been adopted as some second-rate son or daughter. But the Bible indicates that God has fully adopted us in Christ. That means that through our connection with Jesus and through our connection to Jesus, we receive all the rights and all the privileges as if we were Christ himself. In Romans 8 verse 17, it says, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Or go back to that verse five in Ephesians one, it says, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself. What that tells us is before I was even born, God knew that I would be adopted into his family. And as an adopted son into the family of God, the Bible says I have a brand new identity. I have a brand new mission. I have a brand new inheritance that only comes through Jesus. So if you're saved today, you're no longer a part of Adam's family. You need to know that. When you were born, you were. You were in Adam's family. You were created in the image of God, yes, but you were a part of his family and you had an inheritance. You inherited Adam's sinful nature. But if you've been saved, here's the picture that the Bible gives us. You have a brand new family, you have a brand new father, and you've traded your old sin nature for the nature of Almighty God. Now, I'm gonna tell you the truth today. If you are still in Adam's family when you die, you will receive an inheritance of sin and separation. You will receive an eternal, an eternal inheritance of death and torment. But the Bible says when you are adopted into God's family through Jesus, that inheritance is canceled and it's replaced with a brand new inheritance, a brand new eternal inher- inheritance of abundance and joy and peace and life in, in a new place called heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm fired up about heaven. I'm so grateful that I'm going to be able to experience what God promises we will experience, not because of what I've done, but because of what Christ has done for me. You see, because of Christ, I am adopted. And when God adopts us, we become God's sons and daughters. He's our new father. Jesus is our big brother and our savior. And not only that, but we are co-heirs with Christ. He's changed our purpose. He's changed our mission. And he's called us to join him today. May I ask you a question? Have you been adopted? Can you say with certainty today that God has given you his spiritual DNA? Can you say with certainty that you are God's son or God's daughter, never to be the same again? He's wiped the slate clean in your past and he's given you hope for the future. Can the world see the resemblance in your life? When they look at you, can they see who your daddy is? 
Let me tell you this, you can't fake it for long if you're not family. And you can't hide it for long if you are. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Lord, today we pray, thanking you for being a God who came to rescue us. I thank you for being a God that sent your one and only son, not only to live for us and to die for us and to come again on the third day, but you came to pay the price that we couldn't pay. You came to do in our life what we couldn't do for ourselves. You came to give us new life, new hope, a new DNA, a new inheritance. God, thank you for changing our lives. Thank you for making your salvation available to those who need to be changed today. And God, if there is someone within the sound of my voice that cannot say with certainty in this moment that they have been adopted and changed and made new, God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for going with us. Thank you for loving us and not giving up on us. And Father, today we give you all the, all the glory for the things you have done, for the things you are doing, and for the things that are yet to come. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Today I thought we'd do something a little different. I decided to preach the shortest sermon of my life. You can thank me later. Emails can all be sent. No, but in all, all seriousness, you know, Lord, when we started preparing for today's message about being adopted by God, the Lord put a certain story on my heart, and it was a story that I wanted to share with you today. And so I'm going to invite some friends to come up and join me on the stage. This is Kelly and Tara and Precious Canals. If you guys would, put your hands together and make them feel well. Hi, guys. Kelly Canals. Yes, if you sir. guys haven't met Kelly, Kelly is new to our staff team. He's our teaching pastor over church expansion and, man, just helping us fulfill the Great Commission as a church. That's his whole job is to make sure that we don't, we don't miss opportunities. When the Lord says go, we need to be prepared to go. And so, uh, so grateful that, that the Lord brought him and them uh, to be a part of our church family. I've known these guys for about 15 years. And for a long time, we always joked with the Canalses because they had more kids than everybody. Uh, for a long time. I mean, you guys, I remember when you had your sixth child, we're like, are y'all okay? Everything okay with, with you guys? And uh, we're, still, <laughs> we're still trying still to figure not. out the answer to that. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, you know, the Lord several years ago led you guys to open up your home to a seventh child. Hi, Precious. Hi. <laughs> a seventh child. And, and you know, when you, when you see your family picture, one of the things that people always tend to ask is why? What led to that decision? What led you guys to open up your home and really open up your hearts to include one more precious soul in your family? Tara, why don't you take that away? Just let us know kind of the heart behind the decision. Sure, well, how it started was I, we didn't start out saying, let's just collect people in our home. Um, but we had a desire to be obedient to God. And several years ago, God um, just stirred in my heart to start a, a to come alongside and start a, a ministry for teenage girls in foster care in, in Florida. And so we opened a clothing store for teenage girls um, and that were in foster care and girls who've been rescued from trafficking. And they would come shopping absolutely free and they would get clothes and jewelry and shoes and just hygiene items and things. And uh, at the end of their shopping appointment, I'd share the gospel with them and just tell them, look, these clothes are not going to change your life, but I know somebody who will and heal the deepest parts of all of our hearts. And um, one of the girls that came shopping was Precious. Well, I knew Precious and um, just kind of connected in that and she ended up going to youth camp with our student ministry and um, she ended up accepting Christ as her savior and so God just really started um, pulling at my heartstrings to come alongside of her and disciple her disciple her and so that's kind of how it started I would go get her on Fridays from school um, from or from the group home that she was living in and she'd spend the weekends with us and we'd go to church together and we'd get to worship together or on Wednesday nights pick her up so she could come be a part of our student ministry and so that's how it started and then it just grew from there of just a real desire like I mean she 
belongs with us. And she's changed our life, you know. And so um, she's more than just a sister in Christ. She's now our daughter. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Precious, I'd love to hear your story from your perspective. Because, you know, from the family opening up their home, that's one perspective. But man, from your perspective, you know, you've seen different seasons in this journey. You've got the season before you really knew them. You know, this is how you grew up. This is your, the reality of your home. But then you became a guest in their house. And then you went from being a guest in their house to a part of the family. So walk us through those snapshots and kind of give us your perspective of the journey. Well, um, my upbringing was different than most people my age. I was raised by a single father. Um, my mother left when I was about three years old. Um, in that season, uh, Things were great at first, um, but then my dad started to have a alcohol addiction. Um, drugs were introduced into the home and um, just a lot of generational sin, pretty much. Uh, in that time, I think that I felt very abandoned by the Lord. Um, I had this idea of who God was. Um, I knew that he was like some deity at the time, but I had no personal relationship with him. Um, and just because of the things that took place in my home, um, where it was like physical abuse and verbal abuse, uh, I wanted to take my own life. And there was several attempts to do that. And someone started to reach out to me um, in my school and uh, with the counselors and stuff that I would talk to and they had someone come investigate my home and realize that I was living in a house where there was little to no food. Um, I had no parental guidance because my father had just been in an accident and he was paralyzed and so he was in ICU for six months. Um, I was raising myself basically. Um, and throughout all of that, I mean and if I don't have a personal relationship with the Lord, how am I supposed to know like what a father looks like when mine is absent or um, what that unconditional love looks like when I don't feel like I'm enough? Um, so when I went into the foster care system, it looked very different than the normal family dynamic. Um, I bounced around from place to place. Um, there was... There was a lot of things that I wasn't exposed to, um, to I guess to touch in on that, it would more so be uh, that in my situation, I think I viewed myself as living the best life ever um, because I knew no different. And when I would go into these homes or these uh, family, like these family places I'd stay at for like maybe a week or so, I could just never get it down. Like the family dynamic and the love and um, obedience was a struggle for me because I didn't know what that looked like. But the God, Lord was so faithful, honestly. I mean, it took a lot of people saying yes to mentoring me, to discipling me after I accepted Jesus Christ, um, to help me see what it looks like to be a child of God and be adopted into a family, into a healthy family lifestyle. Um, and so when I came to the Canals' house, they invited me on Christmas Eve. Um, I remember thinking from my living situation, I was like, y'all's house is nice. Like, this is the bomb. This is so great. And I was so nervous. I was sitting there they're super quiet because I was like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I, I speak broken English. It was just the worst. Um, and I just remember in that moment feeling like a guest for sure. Um, but as she picked me up on Fridays and I would spend every single weekend at their house, I mean, she was just so faithful in investing in me. I thought on my side, it was just me falling in love with them, but it was both. It was both sides. Um, and so then I joined the family and now I, I barely remember the life before adoption, to be honest with you. It's hard to kind of even just go back through it because I, I just see myself as part of the family. Um, I, I can't explain it. That's awesome. So now you, you know that you're in the family and you not only have great parents, but you also have six siblings. Tell me about your relationship with them and how, how that's changed your life. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> six siblings is a lot, <laughs> especially being an only child. But uh, 
even that is just kind of sweet of the Lord. Um, while I was in foster care, he knew that I would have siblings in the future and just people to love on me so that I could love on them. Um, I am so grateful for siblings, to be honest. A big family dynamic is so funny to me and I just love it so much. It teaches me a lot. It teaches me about um, how like the congregation as well and how church dynamic works. Like my mother always says like when they kept having kids, a lot of them, um, <laughs> that their heart didn't just divide, it grew. And so I think I've taken that um, from that experience with my siblings and like brought that into ministry of uh, the Lord just providing like patience and so much love and then me just getting to know more and more people. And that shows in the ministry that I coordinate as well in local missions. And yeah, so they've had a huge impact. That's awesome. What's the biggest adjustment that you've had to make since becoming a part of the family? Biggest adjustment. Other than well, the bathroom situation. Yeah, yeah. We shared a bathroom, all of my sisters and stuff, yeah. Um, biggest adjustment, it was a complete culture shock, to be honest with you. I, yeah, it was a complete culture shock. Um, yeah, I went from shopping at like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, she's going to kill me. I went from shopping at like Dollar Tree to like Target. Now that's like in my, that's all I am, Target right there. Um, the biggest adjustment would definitely be, uh, I don't know, it took obedience and just submitting under my parents and trusting that the Lord placed them in my life um, for a reason. And I know that they would never intentionally steer me wrong. I know that they love the Lord so much. So just trusting that and being obedient has shown in every aspect of my life with uh, ministry, with my friends and with uh, the congregation as well at my uh, home church in Tampa. Um, yeah, I, the adjustment was just uh, being willing to be open and say yes, and um, yeah. That's awesome. Kelly, I think, you know, this story right here is the gospel. And when I see what God's done in your family, I can see what God's done in my life and in a lot of our lives. I mean, in the gospel story, we're all precious. And we all need the Lord. We need a good father who's going to open up his arms and welcome us home. Man, you've been a great father in this story. But just talk about, talk about your own perspective, but also show how this is a connection to our story with the Lord as well. Well, you know, the, uh, the Lord's been really sweet to us in, in bringing all this together. And, and quite honestly, um, what we're living through now and just how we get to do life together is is nothing short of just the Lord's hand of, of building family. And, um, and the fact that our kids, I mean, we, you asked about just even our, our other kids and they don't, they don't see life any different apart from Precious. This is family, you know? And um, uh, it's funny, Precious, I'll throw you, she said, she would tell our kids all the time, the rest of her, her siblings, she said, you know, you know, mom and dad, they got what they got with you. They chose me. And so, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> but you know, we, uh, I think, man, God, God has taught all of us so much and, um, and God's been so faithful through the process. And, you know, he, he brings to mind for me when I think about just, not just one adoption story, but our adoption story of what what God does in our lives and for us. And the verse that comes to mind is John chapter one, verse 12. And, and John said this about Jesus he, and, and us, really. He said, but to all of us who've received him, to those who've believed on his name, he gave us the right to be called children of God. And it's that next phrase that's kind of interesting. He says, they're children not born of natural descent. In other words, it's not just, we're not born into the family of God because our parents drug us to church and they were Christians. Uh, it's not just our biological kids that are, you know, born in the family of God, but it's those of us who believe on him, who've received in him. And, and it's through that that John makes this statement that so um, grabbed my attention when he says, he gave us the right to be called children of God. What a bold and almost brash statement when we think about coming to Jesus in humility and surrender. And that is exactly how we come to him. But on the flip side of that, we can stand with confidence to say, 
I have the right now, not because of who I am or what I've done or where I've come from or even my family or my background, but because of all that Jesus has done for me and the fact that I've received that, I now belong. And so really the question for us today as we kind of wrap up even this this time, Pastor, is um, do you belong in the family of God? And not just did you grow up in church, but has there been a moment beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can stand and claim that with total confidence and say, I have the right to be called a child of God without doubt, without hesitation, solely resting in the belief and trust of the finished work of Jesus. And it wasn't just a finished work on the cross when he gave his life, but a finished work in your life when you received it. Because something happens we're born into another family. It's a family we belong to and that God's faithful to. Could you say that about your own life? I'd love to do something with us just as we wrap up this time and, and ask you just again that question. If you've never done that, would you like to? Would you like to be adopted and to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your family is the family of God? If that's you, would you do something with me? I'm just gonna invite the whole room just to bow your heads with you. and. Would you just pray this simple prayer and ask God to do what only he can do? And it really starts with our belief. God, I'm believing that you are who you say you are. That what you've done wasn't story time, but it was reality when you gave your life so that we can have life in you and with you, a part of your family for all of eternity. God, you've given us that promise that we can have the right to be called your children when our resumes, our background, our upbringing, our past totally disqualifies us. But because of you and what you can do in us, you change our standing. So Lord, we trust you. I, I wanna give my life to you and believe you wholeheartedly to be adopted into your family in this moment so that I can live for you all of eternity. Oh, and Lord Jesus, help us walk out of this place resembling you more and more, showing off just that life that we belong, that we know what it's like to be a follower of yours, that we can stand in confidence as we live for you. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm reminded of that song we used to sing at the end of the church service in our, our home church. Everybody used to hold hands and sing, I'm so glad I'm a part <laughs> yeah. of the family of God. You remember that song? Oh, yeah. We used to hold hands. That was pre-COVID when we touched each other. <laughs> touched each other. But man, it's, it really, really is. It's, I'm so glad to be part of the family of God. Amen? Aren't you glad God adopted you and he included you? You know, we as a church, for several years now, we felt, we felt like God was telling us that we need to be not on the sidelines of ministry, but we need to be the tip of the spear of ministry in this community for those who are without a home. And I'll be honest, for a long time, we haven't been the tip of the spear as a church. But man, every time I open up the word of God, it seems like God keeps redirecting me to, it is your job, it's your responsibility to minister to those who need, you, need him the most, the widows, the orphans. I keep reading about, about the least of these and those who need prayer for healing and those who are without a home. And God, several years ago, told me that, that our church was going to have the opportunity to be, to be very, very effective in this ministry of foster care in this community. So we started praying and we started thinking and we didn't want to get ahead of the Lord. We were patient. We're waiting for God to, to give us the green light and the right people. And, uh, and God has since done that. And I'm so excited that today we get to announce that we don't have all the answers to this, but we are going to put our step of faith, our foot in the water, and we're gonna start a journey as a church being the tip of the spear for foster care ministry in this community. You know, in one of our meetings, I remember Tara saying, you know, if our church family, if just 2% of our church family opened up their doors and opened up their homes to those in foster care needs right now in our community, it would completely eradicate the need for foster care. If just 2% of us. Most counties in Tennessee have about 60 kids that are looking for a place to call home. Our county has over 150. And so there are great needs in our own backyard. And I believe that God's gonna use this faith family, maybe not to eradicate the need, 
but to make a huge difference for the kingdom. And so today I'm going to invite you to join the team. That doesn't mean open up your home, but it is a team, a team of people in this church family that are agreeing to do a lot of things, to pray, to resource, to open up your homes, to minister to those who are caring for these children. And Tara, I'd love for you to kind of piggyback on that and just talk about some of the practical ways that we can get involved. Uh, But as you're doing that, I want you to go ahead and put on the screen how we can be informed. You can text that foster to 74784. And by doing that, by the way, you're not signing up to have a kid in your home. You're saying, I want more information. I want to, I want to be a prayer warrior. I want to go on this journey. I want to be included with updates and know what's going to happen next. And so, man, I would encourage all of you to grab your phone and to text that uh, while Tara's telling more about the ministry. I would love to. So our church is um, starting a few initiatives to just engage um, and to continue to engage in foster care ministry and adoption. And one of the things uh, we're going to do in the next in the coming months is we're going to create some care communities and some teams that come around foster families, people in our church, people outside of our church, um, to come alongside of them and say, hey, you're in the fight and we want to like support you and we want to come alongside of you and help. And what that means is it can be as simple as a meal, you know? Hey, I'll sign up to bring a meal once a month to this foster family just to alleviate. They have a lot of things going on from being at the courthouse or, um, you know, there's a doctor's appointments and things going on that they just need some support. And so we can do that as a church. And so um, we're going to create some care communities and some wraparound care for some of them. Uh, we're also going to love on some caseworkers in our city. In the Tennessee Valley area, uh, there's a little over 300 caseworkers. Um, they work hard. And they have a lot on their plate. And there's a lot going on in our, um, in our city and in our state for Teacher Appreciation Week. Let me tell you, there's nothing being done for caseworkers who are on the front lines caring for the most vulnerable in our city. And so we want to come alongside them and care for them, pray for them, love them, get creative of ways to bless them and say, stay in there, stay on the front line. We're going to um, start recruiting some foster families, and we're really praying that God will raise up foster families in our church to open up your home and your heart. And is it scary? Yes. I gave God every reason not to pick me, and yet I'm so thankful He did, because I sat on the stage and was crying as she was sharing her story. I just, I never would have imagined that one little yes led to so much yes. And God dreams better dreams for us than we dream for ourselves. So we're going to ask you to start praying about, would you open your home? Another thing we're going to ask um, some people to do, if God lays on your heart, to mentor some kids that are aging out of foster care. What that means is when kids turn 18, they are no longer in the foster care system. So if they start their senior year of high school and they turn 18 in October, guess what? They're an adult. And they no longer have the support of... um, you know, being in foster care. And so we're going to ask some people, hey, would you come alongside at them? Would you teach them how to do woodworking? Teach them some cooking skills. Maybe teach them how to drive. Um, Or, you know, like, you know, the number one prayer request I used to get um, and when I would ask kids, hey, can I, how can I pray for you? The number one prayer request as kids were inching towards aging out of foster care, this will break your heart. They would say, I'm about to age out and I'm really scared I'm going to have nobody to spend Thanksgiving and Christmas with. You know what? I know some people here that would say, come spend Thanksgiving with me. Come spend Christmas with our family. Um, And I know that that can happen right here. So uh, we're not asking you to, you know, take home a a child today, but if pray about it, be willing. Um, I think God's going to do amazing things in our church because of it. It's pretty amazing how God can change a lot with one simple yes. But we've seen over and over again how God always blesses obedience. So, man, I encourage you to pray through this, to sign up to be a part of this text group. In fact, I think it's our our privilege as the church to be a part of this. Not just our responsibility to to minister to those who need ministering to the most, but to it's a privilege to be a part of the family of God and to see how He continues to give us opportunities to share him with others and the love of Christ. 
And so hopefully you've already signed up for that. Text FOSTER to 74784. You can visit fbc.is slash FOSTER for more information. We're going to be giving updates in the days to come. I'm so thankful for Frank Walker who leads our local mission effort. This falls under his umbrella with local missions. Our foster care team, they've been working and, and preparing for this for a long time. Like I said, this has been bathed in prayer, but we can't wait to see what God does in the, in the days to come. Kelly, we pray for this, this ministry as it prepares to launch and just pray God's blessing on it. Uh, and then we are going to close out together. Amen. Let's pray. King Jesus, we, uh, we lay all this before you. We've got many plans, but um, God, you've got a uh, big, big heart and desire for people all around us. And so God, thank you for positioning us as a church to be able to step into some areas that um, quite honestly can have not just impact in this community, but generational impact on families. God, we're, we're believing you for that. We're asking you for that. And uh, God, would you raise up just right from this church, this community, people who would say, I don't know what my yes looks like. God, you write the story, but I'm going to put the first word down on the page. It's yes, it's for you. So Lord, would you go before it? Would you bless it? And we want to make much of it for you in your name. It's in your great name we pray. 